Hi folks, so we're going to talk about a small modification on our normal beta oxidation of fatty acids and that comes when we do a beta oxidation of an odd numbered chain. So this guy here is a 15 0 and if you recall from our last video a 16 0 gives 8 acetyl coas. So let's see what we could get out of this thing if we tried to break it up by normal beta oxidation. So as long as we have an alpha hydrogen here, we can go about normal beta oxidation, and we do. We have two of them. And remember what we're doing with a beta oxidation is breaking off two carbon pieces, acetyl-CoAs. So I'm just going to kind of chop this thing up into pieces every two. And, okay. So now we come to a problem. We have made one, two, three, four, five, six acetyl-CoAs. And then we have a three carbon piece left over. Our choice might be to cut off the last one and cut here. Um, but then we'd be losing essentially just a methyl group. And what, what can we even do with the methyl group? You, it makes it really hard to work with. Um, and it, you can't really have a formal CoA or whatever. So you have to, we have to stick with this carbon, three carbon thing. That three carbon thing is called propionyl CoA. It looks like this propionyl CoA. And what was going to happen here is we made our six, six acetyl CoAs, that's great, uh, and we have our propionyl CoA now. We need to make that into an acetyl CoA like thing or something we can feed straight into the Krebs cycle. Our options would be to remove that carbon, which we said was not really an option, or to add one. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to add a CO2 uh, to make a succinyl CoA, which, as you recall, is a intermediate in the Krebs cycle. So that sucks in the OCO. Yeah? So we can feed that right into Krebs. Which is good. Um, so now we have to talk about how we do that. So we're going to do our beta oxidation. One, two, three, four, five, six rounds of beta oxidation. And then we're going to have to go into a special feeder reaction that will help make do this part. Propionyl to sucks in the OCO. It's actually a two steps, uh, two different enzymes that do this. And we'll talk about that here in the next slide. The enzyme that catalyzes the first step of this is called propionyl-CoA carboxylase. And if you recall, uh, for example, from gluconeogenesis, pyruvate carboxylase is used to stick a, uh, a carboxyl group onto the end of a pyruvate, around to the alpha carbon from the ketone. And all carboxylases use biotin. And biotins um, are great CO2 donors as long as you have an ATP and a bicarbonate to work with. So being able to do any carboxylase enzyme is going to cost you an ATP. And that's going to come in important when we start doing our accounting for the energy we get from odd chain fatty acids. Now looking at our substrate, our propionyl CoA, we have two reactive centers. We have the, the thioester, of course. Um, we're not going to mess with that because it's already bound to CoA. We don't want to screw up its targeting into the metabolism. The other spot that's reactive is the alpha hydrogen. And so that's what we're going to work with here. We're going to pull the alpha hydrogen and generate an enolate. That's going to look kind of like this. Okay. And then we're going to regenerate our ketone and use that to attack our biotin um, and transfer that uh, carboxyl group onto this position here, onto the alpha position. So we're actually going to not be making succinyl CoA in one step because the alpha carbon is the only place we can do the attachment. Uh, it adds a second step where you have to move it around. So we're going to end up with another structure which is 2-methyl malonyl CoA. So here we have our first product, 2-methyl malonyl CoA. Malonyl is named for the three carbon piece in the back here. So this is a 2-methyl malonyl CoA. So that looks great. Um, now what we need to do uh, is we need to, and we have our free biotin, and we're going to just release this guy. Okay. It's not yet succinyl CoA, um, but we can make it one if we are able to just essentially move this group out to the end or move this, uh, yeah, move this group out to the end or move this group out to the end. Either way. What actually happens is we're going to move the CoA piece out to the end um, using an in interesting enzyme uh, called uh, 
methylmalonyl mutase. Next end, the next end. So this is the first appearance uh, of vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is kind of a is a very important uh, cofactor. It's another B vitamin, as we've been learning about, but it is one that specifically does strange transfers or different transfers, and it kind of is a jack of all trades. In this case, it's going to be moving radicals around, uh, and it's going to be grabbing on grabbing and holding on to hydrogen radicals. It can also move methyl groups. It can do a whole bunch of different kinds of stuff um, depending on its context. But in this case, we're just moving moving methyl, uh, methyl or, sorry, hydrogen radicals off of these methyl groups and using it to rearrange the molecule. Recall that mutases move groups around molecules. So this is a good example of a mutase enzyme. So the vitamin B12 is going to be used to do some radical chemistry, and the cobalt center is actually the functional uh, catalytic center of this thing. The cobalt is a, is a transition metal and it's going to help us do some rearrangements uh, with this organic molecule here to methylmalonyl CoA. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to pull a radical hydrogen and we're going to give a radical back to the carbon. So we're going to end up with a vitamin B12 with a hydrogen on it that's radical and we're going to have a radical methylmalonyl CoA. So here's our radical. Our radical, radical is on the methyl group now, if we want to get this to succinyl CoA, all we need to do is move this group over onto that thing. But again, radicals are not stable. There's no resonance here to stabilize it. And so the only way we can really stabilize this is by giving that electron to cobalt. Now, cobalt is going to be much more easily oxidized than a carbon. Uh, it's, a, it's a transition metal, and it don't have great holds on their valence electrons. And so really what uh, we can think about this doing is kind of forming a coordinate covalent bond with the transition metal center. Uh, and that's going to stabilize our, our radical and allow us to do the rearrangement step. So here I've shown it as a coordinate covalent bond to a cobalt-3. Before it was a cobalt-2, and that means that cobalt has been oxidized and lost an electron. Um, and again, this kind of uh, system is going to allow us to do our rearrangement. The rearrangement is going to be this group kind of moving up onto this end, and it's going to give the radical kind of to this methyl group. So it's going to leave here and add here. So you might think of it through this thing acting like this. Or not like that. That's silly. More like one is moving up here to do the to to move the group, the other one is moving onto the carbon and just left. So we make a new bond, move this whole group up onto the end, and we leave a radical behind here, and then our poor cobalt just kind of gets the electron back. So here's our radical rearranged, nearly a succinyl CoA. This is like a succinyl CoA radical. And as you can imagine, the way we finish this is just giving that radical hydrogen back with the hydrogen atom on it to stabilize. And that'll give us our succinyl CoA. Okay, and that's going to go straight into the Krebs cycle, which is going to give us our energy. So the big picture for this is that our succinyl CoA goes right into Krebs, and after succinyl CoA, if you recall from the Krebs cycle, we get a GTP from succinyl CoA synthetase, we get an FADH2 from succinate dehydrogenase, and we get an NADH from malate dehydrogenase, but we had to spend an ATP. Uh, when we did the carboxylase step. So we end up with 3A ATP from the NADH, 2 ATP from the FADH, 1 GTP minus 1 ATP, <clears throat> so we end up with a net of 5 ATP here. So our succinyl CoA is not going to give us the full amount from a 2 acetyl CoA, so we actually get a lot lower yield using an odd chain than we get from an even chain fatty acid. So in the next video I'm going to talk a little bit more about accounting and how to solve for ATPs from different types of fatty acid chains. Thanks.